Hello, you delicious people, and welcome to another episode of Intimate Conversations. And today we are diving in with this amazing man, Xavier, who if you hear little sounds in the background, he there's little mini Xavier's running around the house, or maybe, <laughs> I don't know, we'll, we'll ask him how many little munchkins there are. But I want you to know that you can learn more about him at XavierDagba.com and all of the, this will be in the show notes, the actual spelling and the links of it all. But he is a trauma informed transformational life coach. And he does shadow work. He's a facilitator of shadow work. He's an intuitive healer. He's an EFT practitioners, uh, practitioner and loves to think of himself as an emotional alchemist. One of my favorite books, The Alchemist. I love this. It is his firm belief that personal freedom can only be achieved when we allow ourselves to welcome the wisdom hidden within every emotional state, good or quote unquote bad. Xavier's own transformational journey brought him to dive into the universe of shadow work, and he tends to um, he tends to awaken that within others. And he'd really like to be able to share more about how you can integrate your own shadows today, how you can fully claim your power today. And he feels most alive when he helps people shed their limitations and heal and claim their power and live a life of purpose and tap into their full potential. And as we were starting this interview, his heart is so beautiful. He's like, Whatever's going to serve your audience in the highest, bring it. So um, I welcome you to the show, Xavier. Thank you for being with us. I appreciate you so much, Alana, for not only having me here and the introduction. And um, honestly, um, just like you said, whatever will serve people for their best interest, the most benevolent outcome, this is what I'm here for. And I just want to say everything that I will be sharing for everyone listening, it's only going to be pers perspective. So please welcome what serves you. Um, and do not discard things that are not yet resonant without still exploring. Um, oh. So yeah, this is really the place where I'm coming from. And thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I love that point of view. Like, just stay open. Just stay open. I mean, I don't know about you, Xavier, but sometimes I'll have read a book or heard a podcast like ages ago, and then life will happen. Then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, that's what they meant. That's what they were talking about. So yeah, yes. let it all, let it all seep in. So um, why don't we begin with your journey? Where were you raised and how did the, the different traumas happen in your life? And then how did the, how did the resolution and the trauma work all occur? Like, tell us your can I just say you have like such cute dimples? Can I just say that right now? <laughs> I just gotta say that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, like, yeah. So tell us about your, tell us about your story, love. Where was I raised? I was uh, raised in Central Africa, Cameroon. Cameroon. Uh, this is where I grew up um, okay. until age 24. Okay. Um, and um, I decided for, because I wanted to study deeper yeah. economics, I was an MSc in economics. I had my master's degrees in economics and I got a scholarship to come to Montreal. Oh, wow. Um, and pursue a PhD in, in economics. I did my wow. first year, second year, and I fell out of love with all of it. Um, there was like a ruthless awakening that happened there for me. Like I really fell out of love with the whole system industry and what I was about to teach because when you you know when you do a PhD um one of the paths after that is becoming a professor Got and it. I realized this is really not the path for me so I fell into a slow and steady depression and I realized it was actually the second episode of depression but back home, back then, I had no clue about all of this, like um, emotional, mental health and all of that. I really had no clue. Yeah. And I had a friend talking to me. He was like, man, you, you really look depressed. Wow. Um, you Maybe you could look for some help or something like this. And I was coming from that mindset where, you know, depression is out there it's not for me um uh -huh. I'm just unsatisfied with what I'm doing so I denied it um I decided to quit the PhD okay and um 
there was a major fallout falling out with my family Mm -hmm. um where you know there is a lot of hope a lot of like um investment when um you choose to go study abroad especially from um for where I came from and what happened was just this owning conversations like you betrayed us you're not a part of the family anymore and all of Mm. that so oh wow um it awakened things that I didn't know were there like abandonment issues that I didn't know were there Mm. and it was really just a period of like not even having the verbiage to navigate or to understand what I was going through so it was a really lonely journey of like beginning to dive in to dig you know I was trying to grasp to really bite everything that I could spiritually um, emotionally trying to understand what was going on trying to even face my own emotions numbing was all I did at the time just like Uh, okay I need to find a way to provide for myself I was on a scholarship so um, I needed to find a way to um, you know um, make money make money and um, finding jobs, trying to survive here, feeling like I'm not allowed to go home because anyways, they don't want to see me. Yeah. It was just a deeply isolating time. Wow. And I learned, you know, how to be with myself and mm. really hold myself. In that time, I really learned how to um, rely on myself even more. Not that anyone needs to go through that journey alone, but mm. I was in a new country where I knew yeah. no one. And yeah. I, you know, I wasn't willing to leave the earth quite yet. So I needed to figure out a way to be here. Mm. So that's how my journey really started. And um, that's what progressively led me to the work that I'm doing today, because I Mm. really had to come face to face with my own shadows during the eight years that followed um, me deciding to quit the PhD. So that is, in a nutshell, a little bit of my journey or where I come from. Wow. Thank you. So back in Cameroon, were you the first in your family to study abroad, abroad, get a degree? So they were kind of living through you. The second one. Um, I have an older brother. Um, yeah. He's an engineer doing really well. And yeah. I was the second one. I was actually the first one uh, going abroad. So you, you absolutely correct. So, um, and honestly, I had, for them, it was just like crazy to even consider dropping what I had. I had a full full paid scholarship. Like I, my parents didn't need to pay a single penny for anything when I traveled. So for them, it was just the golden opportunity that um, a little lunatic decided to drop. They didn't understand and um, when I started working, doing a deeper work with professional help, like therapists and um, yeah. this, this kind of help, what I realized is this was just the sum of the peak of something that already started before. Like even mm-hmm. studying economics is not something that I really wanted. I was gifted in mathematics, so I was able to really just like go through that, but it's not something that I ever really wanted. And Mm. I was finally at a place where I didn't have the parental influence, like Mm. the social circle that was influencing me that much. And it's as if I didn't have any other reason to continue doing something that I didn't necessarily want to do. Sure, sure. And I decided to drop. Wow. So that was a time of great bravery to follow your heart's truth bravery to stand in the rejection of your family, bravery to learn how to soothe yourself in a new country where you didn't know even know how you were going to make money. What would you say was the number one, and you can tell me two or three different ways, but what was the first way that you learned how to not numb out and to feel an emotion that felt like shit, but you somehow got through to the other side and were, was stronger. So before you felt the emotion you numbed out but then yes. you learn how to feel it and you're like oh my god now I'm confident or something yes. I'm an emotional alchemist like tell us how you did that you know I, I will always remember this scene it was like I was sitting in that one bedroom tiny apartment and I didn't have money to pay rent and it was like probably two weeks after um 
rent was due and I just had, I, I had received a notice. And now I came from a place where um, I, was, I was never in any kind of like financial hole. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I've had to face through this journey, homelessness. I was never in this kind of places. Yeah. So the level of desperation is really what kind of cracked me open mm -hmm. when I received the note and it was an eviction notice. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there. It was just like, what have I become? Yeah. And I just couldn't hold it inside anymore. Like coming from a place where, you know, my family was never that um, broke, if I'm going to use the term. Yeah. And really falling in what I consider to be like bottom, like rock bottom, rock bottom. It just mm -hmm. really cracked me open. The amount of shame that came through that um, at that moment is really what broke me open. And I just lay down on the floor there. I wailed. I cried. And then at some point, I don't know if it was 30 minutes after, 40 minutes after, there was just this feeling of peacefulness. Wow. I wasn't trying to battle the emotions anymore. I was just crying like a baby. Like the it. ultimate shame that I've ever felt in my life. I was just like, well, I screwed it up. I just screwed it up. Like, here I am. I have no place to be. I have zero money. I can't even pay for rent. And I just stayed in there. And then at some point, I don't know what happened. I can't tell you what happened. It was just a state of, like, nothingness inside, like a peacefulness. Wow, stillness. A stillness. Yeah. And I just started backtracking a little bit. What just happened? I just, uh, I just let it. And it became my um, go-to. I mm. would be sitting in parks at, you know, 1 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> and it would just hit me. I will just wow. sit there and I will just cry. cry under a tree. Wow. And that's it. And wow. then at some point, I take a breath. I'm like, I'm good now. I can um, stand wow. up and keep going. So this is how it really started for me. I had no wow. idea what I was doing. I was just, wow. I was just waiting. I was just crying. But, yeah. but it's very wise now that you've studied a lot more and now that you're a coach yourself, the, what we resist, we all know yeah. grows, right? Yeah. Persists and grows. Yeah. And what we allow, which doesn't mean you probably liked crying. Like, oh, yeah, no. let's do that. That's fun. Like, it wasn't like you liked it, but you allowed it without resistance, without judgment, without criticism, yeah. without control, without trying to get to the outcome. You just yeah. allowed Xavier to be Xavier. Yeah. who just happened to be sad or ashamed or whatever it was in that moment. Like it was the ultimate honor of that part of you in that moment. Yeah. Wow. And it, it was just a complete moment of surrender because yeah. I would hear that like inner critic voice. It's just like, you know, shaming myself for right. everything that happened. And, you know, part of, I was also raised with this like um, belief in agency, responsibility. You have the capacity to change your circumstances. So I would yes. hear that voice, and I would also be like, "Yeah, I did it. Um, I chose to quit. That was my doing." So there was like, at the same time, shaming that was happening, and at the same time, I didn't completely disown that part of me that was like, "I know it hurts, but you can do something about it. You mm. can go get a job." Mm. And mm the very first job that I got that was a, an extremely humbling job yeah. as a dishwasher yeah. in a restaurant yeah so it was really this journey of like me being humbled yes yes deeply really mm. deeply mm. and um criticized publicly mm. um for that choice so it really humbled me tremendously and tell me more about this. I just want to, I just want you to know, like I've had a really sort of shitty morning. Um, <laughs> um, and I was criticizing myself and yeah. then I had a cry and I had yeah. nine minutes before my group coaching call. So yeah. I just dove right into the crying. Yes. Um, and I just want you to know that as we're having this conversation, it's perfect that we're having it today. And yeah. it's perfect that you're reminding me, yeah, feel your feelings without judgment to the best of your ability, even if you hear the shameful thoughts, if you go through all of that, eventually you'll also hear the truth, yeah. which is if you could get a scholarship, you could get anything. If you could quit 
you could start something else. Like you're in charge. You can do this. You got this. Like that natural voice will come through, but not, I call it sprinkles on top of the ice cream cone of shit. Like you can't do it on top of the feeling. You've got to feel the feeling first. Yes. And the, tell us a little bit about humility, because I think um, some people misunderstand that word. I love that word. I'm so glad on my journey, Xavier, that I've um, lost everything, lost my house, went into debt. My son lives with his dad. Like, it's like, not that I, I'm like, yay, I want that for everybody. Yeah. Not like that kind of, I love it. But I love that I went through that because I found, I found self-love, self-acceptance, self-allowance self-care, self-tenderness, um, self-respect to get back up again. And I was a little bit of a victim this morning, crying about my circumstances. So listening to you again, is really helping me to go, okay, I created everything that led to what I'm dealing with right now. And what can I learn? How can I grow? And how can I get back up again? So how, how did you, um, what is the gift of humility for you? And when, tell us the next part of your story after the dishes and washing the dishes i really want to acknowledge what you're bringing up here and you know as it relates to your own journey um and i also want to say for everyone out here if they believe that i happen that i never um have these critical thoughts in my head um in this now moment this is a flat out you know misconception flat out lie yeah still here we are still um, talking together, chatting together in my own head. Yeah. Um, what happened within me is what I'm talking about when I mention humility, it is mm-hmm. learning how to be with the disempowered or the part of you that forgot um, their power compassionately. Yeah. That is really what it um, allowed me to tap into. Mm-hmm. Being with a part of me that forgot that I had agency compassionately. Being with a part of me that was tapped into these feelings of shame, guilt, and mm-hmm. even sometimes bitterness and, and anger compassionately. Mm-hmm. Being with the victim inside of me yeah. compassionately yeah. without adding a layer of judgment. You mentioned that. So one thing that I started doing was just all these thoughts that were just like self-shaming. I'd be like, yep, I hear you. I did that. Yeah, I did that. I did that. Yeah, I got myself here. Yes, yes, Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. all of these things that just, I I realized early on that battling it was just keeping me in this spiral. Totally. I was just like, yep, 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 yep. That was really stupid. Yep, I get that. And I would just like allow myself to go through the purge, allow myself to hold compassionately what was here. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would, the promise that I made with myself was always finishing after all of this, just adding. And I know that I still have the capacity to make Mm -hmm. a new choice. I know that I have the capacity to make a new choice. What I found is it is really, really hard to reclaim your power. Yeah. If you haven't been able to hold compassionately the disempowered parts, if you okay. haven't been able to be there. Say that again, because that is true, but a lot of people miss that step. So, so say that again. It is, it is uh-huh. really, really hard to reclaim your power yep. if you haven't been able to sit compassionately with the disempowered parts of you, if you I haven't would... been able to hold compassionately the victim within you. Thank that you. That has I been don't... my experience. Yeah, I don't even think it's possible to reclaim your power, true power. Yeah. That's the sprinkles that I was talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, it's bullshit. It's fake. It's like motivation. Yeah. Like, get a better mindset. I'm like, oh my okay. god. Oh, it just drives me bonkers. It doesn't work. That's what I did at first. Like, I went to all the, I don't know, fifty dollars seminars that I could um, enter, and all the like. That's what I did. Yeah, I can do it. I can make it happen. You know, I started so many endeavors that didn't really work I owned the gym in some at some point in Montreal I was basically um at some point I was just motivated you know after starting this job like a dishwasher and by the way I stayed in there until you know I eventually got promoted to a cook position and worked in there for five years honestly true true story okay um but I really wanted to show 
my to show my family this is me looking at it in retrospect yeah. i really wanted to show them that the choice that i made wasn't just stupid wasn't yeah. just a silly thing that there was actually something behind it yeah. so i tried to i tried to succeed by their standards ah meaning i need to create my own thing that works really well Mm -hmm. So at some point, I was able to get together with a few partners. We started a gym and it wasn't it. I knew that the way I wanted to help people, I knew I wanted to help people, but it wasn't it. It wasn't yeah. true um, fitness. Three years after we closed, three mm -hmm. years after we closed and we were in more debt than mm -hmm. when we started. Mm -hmm. So the next step was really me coming to a place of surrender and mm -hmm. surrender to what was really the invitation of what I'll call my soul, my higher self, if we're going to put it this way. Yeah. I knew I wanted to help people in some way, shape or form. Yeah. But I was like, who am I to be able to do that? Who mm -hmm. am I to believe that I can help people shift at such a deep level? So I, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, maybe I can start with nutrition and fitness and help people through that. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can start with this new network marketing endeavor. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. And until I really surrendered and I really accepted, there is something here that can help people shift at a deeper level. And it's safe for me to actually reclaim that. Mm -hmm. This is when things started really shifting drastically. Mm -hmm. So you said two important things and then let's keep going. So the the gym was in the vein of helping people, but it was still, I guess we could say tarnished by wanting to prove to your parents. Absolutely. Right? So it wasn't all heart. It was like heart and ego kind of together. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So then you're like, okay, that didn't work because there was, I'm going in the right direction, but there was still mm, proving there. So then Absolutely. you let go of the proving with surrender, which doesn't yes. mean give up or give in, but it means let go of yeah. Of the control part or the trying to look yeah. good part yes and then your heart got bigger there's more space just for your heart now and yes. so then what was the next step that allowed you to go oh no this is it this is what um, I yeah um like the way you summed it up is really so beautiful because there was inner divide mm -hmm. part of me knew even when we signed a deal for the gym that yeah. that wasn't it yeah, I right. knew from the get go. I married two men like that. Don't worry, I get it. Like, so go, it was like I signed okay. a deal, and I was like, yeah. "All right, let's go for a ride." But yeah, I, get I it. knew it wasn't it. Yeah. So when I got to this place, and after you know three years, we decide to shut it down. I tap into this place of just navigating a void, because there were deep seated fears. Like, what is it gonna what What is it gonna look like? Yeah. You know. Um, I really had no freaking ideas and I was receiving mentorship, receiving support, working with um, all these incredible people out there. And um, I just couldn't see it for myself. Mm. The key thing that really made me also, you know, in retrospect, when I was still in the gym, I, will, I started practicing with clients. Mm. of the gym because I was creating meal plans and fitness mm. plans and I would, I, would, I would also coach people mm. a little bit on the mindset a little bit on you know their emotional health as I like to call it I'm just like hey it's not just about what you eat there is more to it yeah. and I tried to bring the conversation there there is one client that told me the conversation that we have mm. on the side of the meal plans that you're giving me they help me way more than um, the meal plans and the workouts you're giving me. Yeah, that was the yeah. first person. I will never forget her name, Denise Jones. I will never forget her. And she was like, what you do with me mm. on the side when we're just talking about things that are blocking me helps me more than wow. all the rest. Stunning. So she, she kind of put me on the path. Yeah. And the, the biggest moment of surrender 2018, I find out I'm going to be a dad. Mm. And the decision that is made in this moment is I'm not going to be an example of a father that decided to just be a coward when it comes to his purpose. 
wow. because the coward archetype was so all over my face. Like mm-hmm. I could, I could talk to people around me. Like I, I was the archetype of the person. People would come and receive free support, free coaching, free everything, and they would go ahead and have tangible results. Yeah. And yet, I didn't want to offer it to the world. You so when that charge. happened, I didn't want to charge. Yeah. I didn't even want to accept that this is going to be the work that I will do with people. Yes. 2018 is really where I say, okay, enough. Um, I'm not going to demonstrate to this son, to this child that will come in nine months, that I'm an example of a child, of a dad that chose to be a coward when it comes to my purpose. I know it may sound harsh, but this is really what made me um, make a change. No, it doesn't sound harsh at all. It sounds like the inspiration of a little baby that woke up your noble badass to face. Well, to me, I don't know about you, Xavier. How the hell do we become brave if we weren't first a coward? How do we learn to forgive had we not first forsaken ourselves? Like that's the that's the way. It's not comfortable. It's not fun. But how can we be courageous, la cour, right? The heart, if we first haven't closed our heart. So so I get it. I said, and I have a, I have a son. I remember looking in his eyes saying, okay, where is this woman of patience, playfulness, pleasure? Where is she? And I remember him being, you know, just on my breast of one years old. And I had married his dad mostly so that I didn't have to feel the pain of my mom dying. And I thought a man and a baby would make it all better. I just wanted to replace my mom. And that wasn't very um, enlightened or kind, but it was the best I could do at the time. And I was wrong and the marriage wasn't a fit and I divorced him. And he wasn't terribly thrilled about that as he ought not to be because my my heart wasn't all the way open because my heart was closed, afraid to lose my mom and just wanting something on the outside to make me feel better on the inside. So I remember looking in my son's eyes and he was my inspiration because I wasn't who I knew I wanted to be for him. So I a hundred percent get it. hundred percent get it. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. So how many little ones do you have now? Three. Three? (laughs) Three under three. So it's- um, Three under uh, three? It's rock and roll. Oh my God. You're a busy busy little baby maker. (laughs) It's rock and roll over here. Wow. Yeah. So is she, are you still in Montreal? Is she Canadian? Is she is Canadian. We yeah. are in Newfoundland, Canada. It's oh, East, Newfoundland. Um, yeah, it's like an island. On the, um, I'm Canadian. Don't you know that? I didn't know. I'm Canadian. I know I've been to Nova Scotia. I haven't been to Newfoundland. Oh, yes. We're in Newfoundland right now. Amazing. I would love to go to Newfoundland. Wow. Yeah. Yep. And their accents uh, are tough. The Do accent, oh, I've, I've been here, um, it's been seven years um, wow. that I come, you know, yeah. we, we used to do back and forth. We just um, permanently moved here this year. Yeah. Um, I used to get nothing. And uh, the way they would speak, they would speak. You couldn't understand word. anything. Yeah, it's tough. Not a word. They had to now, slow down for me. Now you've got the hang of it. Wow. <laughs> There probably aren't a lot of men from Cameroon in Newfoundland, I'm thinking. I haven't, I haven't met one yet. Haven't met one yet. <laughs> How I haven't is, met one yet. How is that for you? Um, honestly, um, it is weird the ways you can happen to feel like home in places that are absolutely foreign. Wow. It is really, really weird. And um, what I've learned over the years is, especially with the the separation and then after that the reunion with my family because Mm. we went through two years and a half of not um communicating and then there was like a reconciliation that happened after how who who reached out first how did that go down there was a lot of like um arrows being you know thrown from uh both sides i have to take responsibility here i was an angry kid after the whole thing happened after i decided to to drop and they felt betrayed i understand and i also felt like i come up i come from a um 
a religious Catholic family. Okay. And I've always been the black sheep of the family where, you know, religion just didn't make sense to me. Okay. So I was kind of rebelling against a lot of that. Yeah. But there is always one thing. There, there are a few things that stayed with my heart, mm. you know, love each other. Yeah. Um, you know, we are family. We are here for each other. And um, so I was really angry when once I decide to do something for myself, something that really was, it was a hard decision. Yeah. I have to take responsibility. I didn't communicate with them when I decided to drop out because ah. I knew, I knew that they would have said something. They would have convinced me to keep going. Mm. I knew that and I didn't want to take a chance. And mm. they mm. heard about me dropping out a year after and they were really angry rightfully so and I was also angry because they were they, they taught me all these noble principles about love about family hmm. and then you know at that point they decided to disown me which I understand and I was also very angry because I was like okay everything that you just taught me my whole childhood is therefore mm -hmm. bullshit everything bullshit, yeah. <laughs> you told me you taught me about love so that yeah. was just bullshit yeah. and um I was really angry I was like yeah. fine that's okay I get it mm, you um, forgave them and forgave yourself yeah it took some time and then I did yeah. and um actually um I made a post recently about a message that I had received from my dad I think it was that was very rest, recent, actually, 2019. He sent me this message um, saying he never truly understood how to raise six children with mm -hmm. all the different sensitivities and how to manage all of that. And if he sure. has done something that hurt me, um, he's asking for forgiveness. Wow. And that really, really broke my heart open. Wow. And wow. The, I think they... they I know how they work. They probably prayed about it. They probably worked with priests. I really know. I know how they usually work when they are feeling um, pain. Mm -hmm. And the same day, my mom sent me another message saying, you know, you're not my property. I was just a channel to bring you here. And along these lines, and she's wow. like, like, you know, um, I just want you to be happy and satisfied. I liberate you something along those lines that like this day i will never forget that day this message this <laughs> message is i have them screenshotted i have them somewhere and um, that that was the instant of reconciliation mm. and something that i learned was authentic self-expression like really voicing what is here yeah without hindering the nature of the feeling that is coming through your heart yeah. is what allowed for that reunion to happen mm. at some point I really gave up trying to be understood by them I was like this is how my life is going by the way this is something that is happening by the way or well, by the way we're expecting a child um mm. I really would like you to be in the life of this child mm. um so if we can work our own stuff out so that we can create room for this this would be great. So this is just how we go about this whole journey without trying to prove anymore, without trying to get them to understand all the spirituality that I was mm. into, shadow work. They're mm. like, what is shadow work? What kind of cult are you into? <laughs> sure, um, sure. Yeah. So that was yeah. really the journey there. Mm. It's really, really good. Letting go of outcome, letting go of expectation, letting go of even being understood. Yes. That's big. You just in total allowance, total yeah. surrender and complete presence and showing up. Yeah. And it sounds like that created space for them to um, do their work as well. Everybody's done their work yeah. and you guys have come back together. How beautiful. Do you, so three, that was three under three, three under three and three parents three. are back. Wow. Parents are back and um, they still don't understand what I do. They don't okay. want to understand. They are still very anchored in their beliefs and stuff. And I honor that, you know. Um, I really don't need them to understand anymore. I don't need them to get me. I don't need them to um, acknowledge my choices. And we, are, we found this place where we can all coexist, mm. meaning... Um, they want to know if I'm okay. They want to know if the family is okay. And yeah. on the other end, I really just want to 
know that they are also doing good and that I can talk yeah. to them if um, I need to. I yeah. also understand that they cannot be the support, yeah. um, spiritual support that I may need at times. I know that this is not the kind of help that I can receive with them. Yeah. And that is okay for me at the moment. Xavier, this is also very brilliant for the viewers and listeners because I think we put a lot of pressure, like let's say on a spouse, you've got yeah. to be everything for me, but yes. they're human. And we're our parents. You have to believe in me. You've got yes. to get me. And and sometimes people have parents like that, but sometimes they don't. And so we don't need to, you know how you say, throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't need to like get rid of the spouse or get rid of the parents just because they are not totally there for you. And yes. with this, this self-ownership that you speak of, we can create five sets of parents. Um, not that you need five wives necessarily, but there's going to be like different <laughs> people, mentors, yes. colleagues, friends, brotherhood, men's group, women's group, whatever. Like we have, it takes a village and to yes. allow ourselves to have the support that we deserve from a myriad of people yes. and not to make anybody wrong if they can't be everything. I think yes. it's very, very wise. And I love that you've found a middle ground and you know how far you can go. And you don't let yourself be a victim or get disappointed if they can't provide something and you have uh, support in other directions. Absolutely. And it seems all, I just want to say, it seems all a reflection of how you've come home to yourself. The relationship that you have with yourself is now like holographically projected out in all these different relationships on the outside yeah. because you've done this, this shadow work that I know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> you've done all this deep, um, deep work inside. I so respect that. And I just love that you live in Newfoundland. Like, who, who <laughs> not? Oh my God. That's amazing. No. Yeah. So the, I want, oh, please. Go ahead, please. The one thing that I just wanted to add on top of what you said, which yeah. is a question that a mentor of mine asked me at that time, it was, how are you still burdening the love you can have for each other with expectations that cannot be met? And I was just I, like, wow. Like, what yeah. did you just say? It was like, how are you burdening the love that you can have for each other? Like, how about you release a few things that are never, that were never meant to be carried yeah. um, by this relationship? How are you still burdening the love that you can have for each other? And yeah. I was like, wow, this is true. I am still trying to be loved by them from the perspective of the boy that I used to be, yeah. not from the perspective of the man that I've become today. Yeah, oh, and stunning. when the shift was made, which is, okay, integrating this boy that I used to be through the work, through um, learning how to hold myself compassionately, learning yeah. how to kind of being the, the inner parent that I always being for myself, mm. the dad that I would have wanted to have. Yeah. Um, yeah. That made a huge shift mm. um, in the way I now relate to my parents. Yeah. Oh, that's so brilliant to to reparent ourselves with that compassion and that listening and that understanding ourself. There's no limit to that. We can just love the shit out of ourselves, <laughs> and, yes. um, and then be an allowance. Yeah. And as you said, lift the burdens and expectations off of everyone else. And yeah. it makes it so much more spacious for people to be with us when we're yeah. pouring that level of listening compassion understanding inside of us i feel so much better talking to you xavier thank you <laughs> well i'm happy that the trajectory of your day is kind of shifting oh completely emotionally. yeah completely yeah, it always it always shifts when i get into contribution and service like i started yeah. feeling not so good and then i, I served my clients and it, i just get filled with love and compassion for them yes. and belief in them and then i start to feel better yeah. um and that's also why i've designed my life to have podcasts so i can talk to incredible people like you and learn Thank and you. grow and and have this figure eight dance of of um yeah just that intimacy of real honest transparent real people's journeys um and how we can all love each other along the way as we're all okay. walk, we're all walking home together absolutely yeah i love that yeah I love that. So I want people to go to xavierdagba.com to learn more about your transformational life coaching. Um, and so how, as we complete this conversation, and it's really, there's a guy named Corey Poirier. He lives in PEI. Mm -hmm. um, I have a bunch of friends in Nova Scotia. So the next time I go to the Maritimes, I'll be like, okay, now I have to go to Newfoundland. And Please, Xavier I'm going to get you to eat some. 
some local food. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I so love it. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, you're just a you're just a gem. How would you like to complete this conversation from your beautiful heart to all um, viewers and listeners? Well, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to um, be here with you and to just stand in this space with you. The way I would like to end this um, conversation is you talked about, I mean, the whole message that your soul carries has to do with intimacy mm -hmm. and uh, the journey that I went through and the journey that I very often bring people through is really getting them to a place where they can be truly intimate with themselves yes, yes. in a way that can be tremendously transformational and what i've learned for anyone that is here experiencing the pain that they think will destroy them that they think will annihilate them yeah. um, the kind of pain that we feel afraid of surrendering to because we believe that we're going to lose our sense of self yeah the reality is you will you will lose the sense of that self that you are right now in this moment because that self is not what will serve your highest expression. But is there, there's a new self that you're invited to become intimate with. Yeah. And that new self may still be burdened by sorrow, by pain, by sadness, by guilt, by shame. There is a way to emerge out of it. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that the more you allow yourself, instead of, flying above all of yeah. that pain allow yourself to become intimate with it mm -hmm. allowing yourself to enter it allowing yourself to emerge from it and yeah. to become intimate with the new expanded self that is waiting for you on the other side yeah this is really what my journey has shown to me there is a deeper level of grace that you can tap into mm -hmm. if you're willing to undertake that journey totally that's stunningly said it's like an alchemy occurs. And yes. as you were speaking, I saw like a heart that broke, but underneath it was a bigger one, yes. a brighter one. But it, it did hurt, the breaking hurt, and it's a journey, and yes. it takes bravery for sure. But that emergence that you're speaking of through the pain to this deeper level of self is evolution. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. So you get it. Oh, you're so cool. I, well, really... I appreciate you. Mm, I appreciate I you. And I would like to say it speaks a lot about, you know, what is happening um, collectively at the moment. If there are some people right here, right now that are losing hope, mm. this deep transformational journey, in my own personal opinion, is what is happening at the level of the planet. Mm. This being that we call a planet is going through her own evolutionary journey. Yeah. And she's meeting her own shadows. And mm -hmm. I truly believe that there is a way out of here where we are in this moment. And it is really hard to see on the other side when we are entrenched in the shadow. But I'm inviting everyone that may be listening to this in this moment, to just allow themselves to do the work and to meet compassionately whatever comes up here in this moment as we navigate this because we're getting through this. That is my firm belief. Mm. And I hope it can be a beacon of hope for people out there. Mm. Stunning. Yes, it's in the darkness, in the shadows where we find the light. Yeah. So lean in, lean in and allow that spark, that light to from within uh, each of us to, to awaken, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. XavierDagba.com. Check him out. Thanks, um, Alana. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, in conclusion, beautiful people, there were gems in this. I'm sure you were taking notes the whole time. My request is, when you finish listening to this podcast, is to sit down, reflect, maybe go for a walk in nature, maybe sit under that tree and have a good cry, like Xavier was, was sharing with us. Just take some action that has been inspired through this conversation so that you can say your life literally took on a new trajectory today because of you taking time to love you, slow down and let this conversation ignite something in you. We love you, we're here for you. And until next time on Intimate Conversations, all of our love.